Morning, everybody. Super Bowl Sunday. So good. You can almost be sure that the preacher's going to be short on Super Bowl Sunday, right? I uh, got you fooled. Uh, well, we're in a series. We're wrapping up a series today, Walking in the Dark, and I'm really glad we're wrapping it up. It's been a really tough series for me to preach. Um, if you haven't been in the series, uh, maybe this is your first weekend uh, here and you haven't been here in the last few weeks. Uh, I've been uh, kind of expressing my journey through grief of losing uh, my son Chase in a car accident seven months ago. He's 21 years old and, and uh, just processing uh, my journey. Uh, the, I'm, I'm not processing with you. I've already processed it, and I'm kind of sharing with you what I processed and, and the questions that I had and, and really talking deeply about how do you have hope when, when it seems like God has disappointed you? How, do you? how do you have hope in him? And really, ultimately, how do you trust in God? Because what you believe about God determines whether you trust him or not. And so what do you believe about God? And we've been talking about the different characteristics of God, that he's sovereign, that he's all-powerful, um, that he's good, that he's for you and not against you, and that he's faithful, that he's consistent with his promises. But you throw in uh, one other variable, and that's evil and, um, and tragedy into that mix, and you begin to question, is God sovereign? Is he good? Uh, is he faithful, right? And so we've been digging into that, uh, those questions, and um, obviously we've been trying to answer some of those questions over the last few weeks. This weekend, um, last weekend, I, was, uh, I just felt like it was right for us to um, not just talk about my story, but to talk about your story. And so I asked, last weekend, I asked uh, you to send me questions about um, faith, uh, your relationship with God, about uh, your, you just, the questions that you have about tragedy and evil and suffering and, and, and on and on, and I, I kind of open-ended. And so I got, I got dozens of questions from all of you, ranging from things like, you know, why does God allow suffering to can I get a tattoo? <laughs> so... <laughs> And I'll be honest with you, I want to tackle the tattoo one and not the first one, the other one, the, the, the other ones. But the ones that I, that I chose today, I, obviously I can't answer all of the questions that were sent in. Uh, we're going to figure out ways to respond to those questions because the, this is the deal about the questions that, were, that came in. Nobody gave me one-line questions. Everybody gave me a story about why that question is there. And there's a lot of brokenness um, my story is your story. Your story is my story. There's a lot of brokenness and hurting people in our, our, in our faith family and who are struggling with uncertainties and doubts, um, as we all do. And I love that we are a community of faith that can be open, honest, and vulnerable with one another to the point where we, can, we feel comfortable sharing um, our, our doubts and our uncertainties without feeling like we're going to get slammed with some religiosity. You know what I'm saying? That, that, you, that you leave feeling worse about yourself. Rather, that we all have questions, we all have doubts, and that's okay. That's part of this journey that we call faith. Um, and so I want to talk about, uh, I'm gonna, I picked seven questions to answer out of the many that came in. Um, and uh, I, I sent all the questions to a, a handful of people in our church, um, just asking for input, um, thoughts that they had uh, about the questions. And Jim Stevens was one of the uh, ones, and he responded back to me, several pages that he sent back to me, really helpful. But the first thing that he wrote on the top of the page is, what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and you'll find out. I was like, wow, I'm, we're going to tackle some pretty hefty uh, questions, um, but th and and uh, and this is the deal, though. Here's a few caveats to this uh, this service today, um, and this is this one I know really well is that there isn't any answer that will take away your pain. There really isn't. I, I would love to be able to tell you that because I know God is good, that, you're, then that, he'll take, that, that knowledge will take away your pain. That's not what knowing God is good does. And, I, and, I, and my suspicion is that there isn't really any truth that will take away the hurt that you're feeling from the brokenness and tragedies in your life um, or around your life. Um, so that's important to know. Also important to know is that these questions and um, issues that, will, that you sent to me um, have been wrestled with and occupied theologians and philosophers thinking for a really long time, and they haven't come up with a lot of great answers to them. So, so know that. That's kind of my out, right? 
<laughs> uh, and really, my goal isn't to answer your questions. Um, I'm not going to set myself up as an answer man to, to the dilemmas that we face. But I, what I do want to do, though, is to try to give you some, uh, some, something to hold on to um, as, as you walk through the darkness that this life can be, um, some things that you can um, grab onto from God's word. Now, thinking about God's word, what we've often done with the Bible is that um, we've treated it kind of like a manual for living. What I mean by that is like, okay, God, I need a, I need a new job. What kind of job should I get? Oh, great. Thank you. That's not what this is for. That's not how you use this. What this is is a book that was written um, to help us dig into who God is and wrestle with those truths, to dialogue with others that have gone before us, to, to sit in rooms with other friends and family members uh, and, and, and ask questions about what this uh, book says and how does it apply to my life because this is what I believe about the Bible and about the scriptures that I'll read to you today is that I believe that the Bible is transformative for today. It is living and active. It has something to say to your situation. It may not give you the resolution and all the answers that you want, but it will give you transformative power within yourself uh, to speak to the issues that we face today. Um, in, in light of that, there's uh, a lot that I'm not going to say that could be said. And so what we've done is we've created a web page where I've listed um, uh, over half a dozen resources that I strongly encourage you to dig into because I, you'll find that I'm just kind of hitting surface, kind of surface, answering these things surface level, right? So there's a lot more to be had. And you can find those resources at westsidechurch.org slash blog. Um, and I would strongly recommend that you check some of those resources out. So Jesus, as we approach your word as we approach these questions and the hurt uh, that is really all around us, uh, even in people within our family. I pray, God, that you would um, help us to see what you want to say to us. Help us to hear what you want to speak to us, God. We want to see and hear uh, from your spirit what you want us to see and hear today. So guide our conversation in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's dive right in. And you can ask me later, what were you thinking? All right, so here you go. Here's question number one. This is from Adam. What purpose do God's plans serve if evil can intervene or if we can screw them up ourselves? Adam's asking, what purpose do God's plans, if, if God has a purpose for everything that happens, what, what purpose do they serve if evil then can intervene or if we can kind of screw things up ourselves? Great question, Adam. The, um, great book that I would really recommend to Adam and to any of you that are really struggling with the question of evil, why evil uh, is in this world. There's a, a book called uh, If God, Why Evil by Norman Geisler. And in that book, he writes these words. Simply put, that we don't know a good purpose for some evil does not mean there is no good purpose for it. There are many things we don't know, and there are many things we once did not know, but now do know. So it should be expected that in the future, we will discover good purposes for things for which we do not now know a good purpose. <laughs> I tell you, you got to read this. This is amazing. Added to this is the fact that we have later experienced learning things that once we could not explain. This gives us reasonable confidence that in the future we will be able to explain good purposes for evils we cannot, cannot now explain. What he's saying is that we didn't know every, you didn't know some things when you were 12 years old that you now know, right? So using that logic, you could say that there are other things that you do not know right now that you may know later. For instance, um, just because I can't see a good purpose in my son Chase dying doesn't mean there isn't one. I'm not saying there is one, and I haven't figured that out yet. But I cannot say just because I can't see a good purpose means there isn't one. Um, and then you add to that, um, in Romans chapter 11, verse uh, 34, Paul writes these words, for who can know the Lord's thoughts? 
Who knows enough to give him advice? <laughs> Not me. Who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him, everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory, all glory to him forever, amen. So I add this to my my wrestling with the why, God, that you allow certain things to happen. I begin to realize I don't know everything. And just because I can't see good in the tragedy of my son's death doesn't mean there isn't any good that will come from it. And I can lean into my trust in God for those things that I can't answer. Geisler goes on. If you thought the last one was deep, listen to this quote. This one is like, ooh, my goodness. At first, at first glance, it, it rubs you kind of the wrong way. Geisler writes this. He says, God is the author of everything, Okay, he's talking about God's sovereignty. God is over and above all things. God is the author of everything, including evil, in the sense that he permits it, but not in the sense that he produces it. Evil happens in his permissive will, but he does not promote evil in his perfect will. He is not the immediate cause of evil actions. He neither promotes them nor produces them. He permits them and controls the course of history so that it accomplishes his ultimate purposes. Just as Joseph told his brothers, right? He said, you meant this for evil, but God intended it for good. Did God throw Joseph in the pit? I said this well, I can't remember last weekend, whenever I said it. God, God didn't throw Joseph into the pit, but he did use it for what? His purposes. Not even Joseph's purposes. It's bigger than that. It's larger than that. Um, God, Geisler continues writing, overrules the evil intent of humans to accomplish his ultimate good, either in this life or in the next. See, just because God knows everything, right, doesn't mean he causes everything. You can't put, just because God sees the beginning and the end, you can't, uh, you can't hold him accountable for everything that happens. Why? Because evil exists. In Job chapter 42, Job is having a conversation with God. Uh, and if you know the story of Job, uh, it's, it's crazy because um, Satan comes to God in the narrative of Job. And I think, and, 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 I, and I'm not sure if it's more analog, analogous or if it's actually what happened, but either way, it's in the word for are good for our for purposes to help us see why some things happen. Um, and so Satan comes to God and says, God, I want to take on Job because everybody thinks he's all that and thinks that he's righteous and that you won't ever do anything or allow anything to happen to Job. So can I have your permission to go um, and take uh, and, and, and give some hardships to Job? God says yes, and I know that causes some other problems, right? Um, and, and we've talked about that in previous weeks. But this, but so, so Satan comes and he's allowed to take from Job everything Job has. I'm so glad Job's in the Bible because I can always say at least I'm not Job. Right? So, and, and so Job has some problems with this. He has some issues with God that he allowed Satan to do this. And so he comes to God, as the narrative goes, and he says, God, what are you doing? I've served you faithfully. I'm righteous. I'm, I've upheld your law. I've done everything you've wanted me to do. Why are you allowing this? And, he, and, he, and, he, and he try, he's starting to put blame upon God about, God, you are responsible for this. Who do you, you know, what are you doing and, and why are you doing it? And God, in like three chapters, and it's really heavy, heavy stuff, pretty much says to Job, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Were you there when the world was created? Do you, do you understand how everything works and is formed together? And so Job is confronted with, with you know, he's having this discussion with God, and it's like his, and God's allowing it. He's, he's, he encourages it. And Job replies to the Lord at the end of the book of Job, and he says this after this conversation. But he's, he, he blames God. God responds. Job says, I know that now that you can do anything, and no one can stop you. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It was me. I did that. I questioned. And he goes on to say, I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. And Job says, I only heard about you before, but now 
I have seen you with my own eyes. And then he says something that I have said to God on more than one occasion. I take back everything I said. I take it back, God. I had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, another um, author and speaker and um, philosopher, an apologist that you should uh, read and listen to is Ravi Zacharias. Um, and uh, I can't get into it with you with, about what he says about evil and why evil, but it's, it's deep, deep waters, and it really will help you. So that's, that, the link to the website for him is on the blog as well. All right, let's go on. Number two. Um, as a naturally born warrior, this is from Denise, and it's a long question, but I feel like I needed to give you the whole story. As a naturally born warrior, I found this trait in myself grow as I became a mother to two precious children and a wife to the most wonderful man. Bordering on the side of anxiety, I found myself often worrying about the worst. Does anybody else do that? All right, yeah, there's a lot of us, right? What if something happens to any of them? How would I go on? What would happen to my faith? You said God doesn't cause everything in your life. This really spoke to my heart, but it also struck a bit of fear from the enemy in my heart as well. It had me questioning, certainly not for the first time, God doesn't cause everything in our lives, but why doesn't he stop bad things from happening? Anybody ever ask that question? He is all-powerful, all-knowing, and if anyone could prevent tragedies, it's he. I've asked this question several times since my father's ugly battle with Alzheimer's that led to his death last year. I've asked it when there are mass shootings, terrorist attacks, head-on collisions, freak accidents, etc. I've also wanted to know a godly response to this question because so often when I'm found in a conversation about religion with a non-Christian, this is one that comes up a lot. If there is a God, why does he allow such terrible things to happen in the world? Do you have any friends, church, do you have any friends out there that use that as a reason to not believe in God. Let me just stop there real quick before we, we go on with our question. It's interesting. Zacharias, um, Geisler, um, Timothy Keller, several other guys, um, look at this, uh, this argument for the non-existence of God by using evil in the world. But that logic, if, people, if you follow it down, that if you believe that there is evil in this world, then that will lead you to believe in the existence of God. There, there's no, it's not possible to have evil in the world without a higher moral judge above it all. So even the fact that people say there's evil in the world, why it could be their God? Well, that's why there, I mean, that's why you, you know there is a God is because there is evil in this world. Um, anyways, it's really deep waters. I won't go into it anymore. <laughs> you can check out their stuff. Um, she writes, I know that you don't know the answer to this question. Good, let's go on uh, to the next <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but she says, or maybe you do. I know it's something that runs through everyone's minds, and I just wonder if you've heard a Christ-centered response to this hard one. Why does God allow evil? You know, I've, I've thought a lot about this for obvious reasons, and I've asked God, God, why don't you just do away with it, right? Why don't you get rid of evil? Why don't you just take care of it already? Come on. I mean, this world is getting worse, not better. Um, there's so much more tragedies and injustices than I could ever remember in any other time in my life. God, why don't you just take care of it? And then I, and then I realized something, that if he was to rid, get rid of evil in this world, he would have to get rid of something else. Oh, man, you guys are with me. Us. You and me. I know. Wow. I came to church to feel better about myself, Steve. <laughs> but you can't get rid of evil without getting rid of free will. And if you get rid of free will, you're all just a bunch of robots. At the, just at the beck and call of God. I'll do, do whatever you tell me to do, God. Just tell me what to do. I'll believe in you even. And that's not, God is not willing that anyone would perish. He does not want anyone to walk through this life knowing him because they have to. Uh, knowing them because they're forced to. Free will is a big deal when it comes to relationships in general and especially with God. Um, so you can't rid the world of, world of evil without ridding the world of free will. And if you get rid of the world of free will, you have a bunch of robots controlled by God. C.S. Lewis talks about this in his book, um, The Case for Christianity. He writes, God created things which had free will. That means creatures which can go wrong or right. Some people think they can imagine a creature which was free but had no possibility of going wrong, but I can't. I mean, you just, right, we have some two-year-olds in the house, right? You know what I'm telling you? You know what I'm saying? If a thing is free to be good, it's also free to be bad. And free will is what has made evil possible. Why then did God give them free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. A, word of, a world of automata, of creatures that work like machines, would hardly be worth creating. 
He writes, the happiness which God designs for his higher creatures is the happiness of being freely, voluntarily united to him and to each other in an ecstasy of love and delight compared with which the most rapturous love between a man and a woman on this earth is mere milk and water. Mm Mm-hmm. And for that, they've got to be free. Of course, God knew what would happen if they used their freedom the wrong way. Apparently, he thought it worth the risk. Timothy Keller says that the Bible says that Jesus came on a rescue mission for creation. He had to pay for our sins so that someday he can end evil and suffering without ending us. Because of Jesus, one day he will conquer evil without conquering us. And we enjoy a relationship with him. All right, number three, let's keep moving. There's seven questions. Well, this starts to move a little bit quicker. Number three, I love Jesus. I trust him for my life, and I know he is faithful to me, but I don't know how to trust him for my adult children. Can I? Can I trust him past their free will? Can I trust that God will save my adult children and bring them to himself? This is from Jane. Jane's a great question. It's a it's a dilemma, isn't it? I mean, to be honest, I can't trust myself past my free will. I mean, it's really it's really hard to trust God for other people's choices. Um, because of free will, we have choice. Your kids have choices. Parents, if your kids choose to walk away from God, it is not your fault. It is not on you. Um, they make choices. We make choices every day. We make choices for right and wrong, to believe or not to believe. That, that, and, and, and yeah, we can, we, that's why we prayed up here for these families is we want to help create environments in our homes and in our churches where, where young kids can meet Jesus. But listen, at the end of the day, they're going to make their choices. Now, I don't, that's, that's kind of, that sounds kind of depressing, but this is the reality is that we can pray for God to intervene on our children's behalf. Do you know what I pray? I pray that my kids will run into Christians everywhere they turn. Good ones. Uh, that sounds bad, but I, that's what I pray. I pray, I do, that's, I actually do make that caveat, but I do, I pray that if my kids start to wander a little bit from their faith, I, I you know, there's a point, right, parents, that, that your kids stop listening to you? Can I hear at 12 years old, 13, 14, right? Where, and I start, and I pray that God would bring other men and women to come alongside my children, and he does answer that prayer. He does answer that prayer, but still my kids have to choose to listen to those other influences, right? It's, it's, you know, there's no manipulation here. This is our choice, our free will. And another thing about this question that I feel strongly about is that we cannot hold God accountable for people not embracing him. You can't hold that. You can't hold God accountable. We have choice, Um, but let's pray and let's live, live life in such a way that it's compelling to our children as well. All right, number four. I have always wondered, this is about prayer, I've always wondered that if God knows all plans and fates and all people have free will, then why do we pray, right? Why do we pray if God knows the beginning and the end and and he's gonna work out his purposes no matter what, why do we pray? Why pray if God knows the ultimate destiny? This is from Kelly and then Vicki added to this. Why We know that God is sovereign and because he is also all-knowing, he knows what will happen in the future. So where do our prayers come in? If I pray every day for God to put a hedge around my children and I pray in Jesus' name and I am righteous, man. The Bible says that God will hear and answer every prayer. I just, I'm just going to add a little answer to that. He, he does answer every prayer, maybe not the way we think or want, or, you know, but he does answer every prayer. Does that mean that the answer is no when a tragedy occurs? Um, this is by Vicki. Great, great questions. A couple books uh, to refer to because I'm not get the answer, man. Uh, it's by Timothy Keller. Uh, one is called The Reason for God. Chapter 2 in particular uh, discusses this. And then also he has a great book called Prayer. Um, I highly recommend both of those. But let me just kind of dive into this. James does tell us, um, Vicki referred to this, that, um, that a righteous man's prayer avails much, that God listens to prayers of a righteous man. He, earlier in, the, in his book, he, he says that we have not because we ask not, right? So there's this sense in which you, you read the Bible and you go, wait a second, God does answer prayer, um, but, but why does, does he not answer all prayers? Is he, is he not listening sometimes? I mean, doesn't he know what I need? And that's the deal. 
is that we've made prayer um, a, a can I have, why aren't you, will you, rather than what prayer was meant to be, which is a relationship built over time. I mean, imagine if I uh, came and told my wife, um, and I, I did this for like a year, and the only conversation I ever had with Suzanne was started with something like, I need, I want, can I have, will you give me? How long is that marriage going to last? I give it a year. I give it a year if I tried that. See, there's, there's something powerful about us praying to God, um, but we have to pray according to his will. And you're like, oh, man, Steve, I don't know God's will. I know, it's not easy to f- discover what God's will is. That is why we need to spend time in relationship with him, reading his word, discussing its truths with other uh, men and women of God. We need to dig into this and spend time in his presence, talking with him so you can figure out over time what God's will is. The most confident prayers I've ever prayed in this life are the ones where I know for certain what God's will is. And I can pray with so much more confidence uh, because of that. Um, but prayer primarily is a relationship uh, that, 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 you know, you listen, you respond, you ask, certainly ask for what you need, but always be ready for God to say, well, I'm going to do something a little different. Do you give everything your kids want to them? Whenever they ask you, you just like, oh, sure, yeah. Johnny, you're 14, but I'll get you that car. Yeah, that's a good idea. No, you know, it's, there's limitations, right? And God knows more than we do. All right, let's keep going. Oh, this is number five. I like number five. This is the fifth question here. I don't have a spiritual question. Well, maybe it is, but an important one. This is from Annie. I was thinking that if you and the leadership team are going to be tackling our church's questions, you are going to need some pie. I'm a pie baker here in Bend, and I'd love to drop off a few pies to the church office if that's okay. Here's her question. What kind of pies do you like? Anything with cream, Annie. Anything with cream. Actually, I'm not a huge pie eater, but I asked the staff. I I took a little poll, Annie, and it is cream wins out. But Corey does want meat pie. So um, I don't know if you make that kind of pie. Thanks, Annie. Great question. Could have used a few more of these. I'm just saying. A few more of these would have been... Great. All right, number six, two more questions. How do you have faith? This is a good one, really great question. How do you have faith when you believe for healing and you haven't seen it? Wasn't every sick person Jesus came in contact with healed? And doesn't he command us to heal the sick? This is from Jean. She says, I just don't get it. And I know it's a really tough one, right? First first thing is that Jesus didn't heal everyone that he came into contact with. Um, it's, he just simply didn't. In John chapter five, um, it's a great, great story. Um, Jesus goes back to Jerusalem and he, um, and he's there for one of the holy days. And this is in John chapter five and he's inside the city. There's this sheep gate and near the sheep gate is this pool called Bethesda. And Bethesda had healing properties or it was believed to have healing properties. And so sick people would gather around this this pool, and when it bubbled up, somebody would jump in, and the first person in gets healed. That kind of idea was a bit of a folklore. So that's, what, that's where this, this, this story happens. And Jesus shows up there, and it says in verse 3 that there were crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, laying on the porches. And one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? And he said, I can't, sir, because I, no one can put me in the pool. I can't get there on my own. And then somebody beats me to it and all of that. And Jesus looks right at him and says, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. It's, I've got this. And yet you read this story and you realize that there were so many other people that he did not heal. There were, there was crowds of people there and Jesus didn't heal. I mean, imagine, does that, does that make you wonder a little bit, right? The guy that can is standing there in the crowds of people that are sick, and he decides to heal one person. Again, I don't necessarily understand the ways of God and why Jesus would do that for one and not for all, but what I, but what I do know is two things. He doesn't heal everybody, but he does heal somebody. And because he doesn't heal everybody, most people decide that I'm not going to ask him to heal anybody. And, that, and I believe the story is in here, not just for us to kind of question, like, God, what are you doing? But it's in there for us to realize that Jesus still heals. He is about that. 
but it's not for you and me. See, oftentimes we think, well, I just want longer life. So this guy that got healed, did he eventually get sick and die? Probably. Has anybody seen him around? I mean, <laughs> Lazarus was raised from the dead. Big, big deal miracle. I mean, I've looked around on fake news and everything. I can't find him. He's not, he's not here. He died again. Where was Jesus the second time? You see how silly this becomes. See, we think healing is about uh, making our life better, extending our life. But what if it's mo about more than that? What if it's about God's purposes, his plan, his purposes happening in and through our lives rather than yours? If that's what it is, then I, just, I, I can start to understand why he heals some and doesn't heal everyone if it's not just about me. So there's that. All right. Let's keep going. Number seven. My question is about life after death. Oh, good. Let's end with a really easy one. <laughs> life after death. I just lost a brother two weeks ago, and three years ago, my sister passed away, and my parents have been gone for a long time. This is from Marine. Marine, I'm so sorry for your loss. It's a um, very difficult time, I'm, sh I'm certain, for you. Um, she writes, with these losses, I sometimes wonder why I never dream of these guys or get a sense that they're out there. I know that it's all about trust, but it scares me to think I'll never see my loved ones again. Do you struggle with this in regards to Chase? And I, yes, I have. Um, it's, because this is a life of faith and not certainty, we all will have questions, right? There will be times where we wonder, um, are we on the right side of this? You know, are we... What we believe, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different beliefs out there. Are we on the right side of this? And it comes through faith, right? And so faith isn't always, faith is believing in things that you cannot see. So there, are there have been times where I have struggled with it. I think everybody that's authentically looking at their faith realizes that maybe they do. But she writes, life would seem pointless without the knowledge that we'll be re reunited. And then Robin asked a similar question, what's your perception now of heaven? Um, I can say, even though that I've had doubts um, at times about the afterlife, um, I can stand here today with full assurance um, that my son is with Jesus. And the reason I can tell you that is not um, necessarily because of the way Chase was living, right? We like to think that the way you live in this life determines whether you get to the next life. Um, but that, um, that, that there's some funkiness about that because the guy that was hanging next to Jesus on the cross who was there on and he was supposed to be there because he was a thief. And he's on the, on the cross, and he looks over at Jesus, and he says, he says Jesus, um, man, I don't know you, I don't, but I, I, I'm watching how you're, how you're going through this, and uh, I want to be where you are. Can I go with you? And Jesus turns to this guy and says to him, you'll be with me in paradise today. And, be, and, and so I know that if Jesus can say that to that guy, then I know that my son, who did have faith, is with Jesus today. And, he, and, and he's not here um, somewhere, right? Um, he's not, I, you know, I don't, I don't dream about Chase. Um, I don't sense his presence. Um, he is not here. Um, he is not here. He is with our Lord. He, is, he, is, he has passed from this life to the next life, and that is at a, another dimension. It's another, uh, and, and, it, and it, it's something that I hold strongly to, and it encourages me, and it gives me faith, because I know what Paul writes, to be out of the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, that, that, and, and Paul struggled with this, and, and, and you know, when you think about death in particular, it's, it, doesn't every death just feel a little off, like wrong? You know what I'm saying? I mean, some more than others, I get that. I mean, if somebody lives a full life and they die in their 90s or something, and, and, but there's still, even in that, you just, there's still something that goes, this, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. And you're right. We were not supposed to die. God created this whole thing for us to live together in relationship with him. And because of our sin, because of our choices, free will, there it is, right? Evil entered the world. And now we die. And, and, and so, so as I think about the next life, I realize that one day evil will be conquered, death will be done, sickness will be vanquished, and we will live forever. And dang it, my son got there before me. <laughs> right? Paul talked about this. Man, I just, man, 
to live as Christ because I got, I, there's still stuff to do. Man, there, are people, there are people who are yet to know God. There's still work to be done, but I know this, that to die is gain. Why? Because then I get to enter into glory. I get to enter into my glory, the, one that, the, the, the thing that God prepared in advance that Jesus left to, to prepare a house for me, like a place to hang out with him. That's what he's doing. That's what's on the other side for us. And because of that, I have great hope. Suzanne is going to speak on this uh, in a few weeks. Uh, my wife on her kind of a revelation of heaven that she received. And one of the things she says about this, she says that the idea, this is how she viewed heaven early on in her life. She says the idea of a never ending church service didn't sound great as a teenager. And it really doesn't sound much better as an adult. After Chase died, as soon as I could grasp that he was gone from this world, I heard God whisper into my very soul, I've got him, Suzanne. He's with me. I don't don't mean to be um, morbid or anything, but when I went to see um, Chase after he died um, to see his body, Suzanne and I went in there and I did what I have done other times in my life, and I prayed for life to come back. And it didn't, and and so I knew that God's purposes somehow were being done in all of this, even though I didn't understand it, don't understand it. Um, And then later, I was contemplating that moment um, with Suzanne and Chase's body, and I realized something really powerful is that if, why would I want, why would I want Chase to come back? And I I know it sounds morbid and there's a lot of reasons I want him back. But once you get a vision of what the next life is, once you begin to see and believe that Jesus is present in that place, face to face, when you, be, when you believe that God, that he went in to prepare a place for my son, and you, and you begin to believe what's, what it's going to be like, you begin to realize, okay, wait a second, wait a second. I've been looking at this all wrong. This life is a shadow. The next one is vibrant. This life is just, it's just like practice. The next one's the game. And that, that has helped me to process as I think about the next life. Well, let me finish up, you guys. We've got to go. This is the deal. I want you more desperately, more desperately than anything else in my life. And the, and, and the reason why this church exists, the reason why I believe God has brought you to this church is so that you could do two things. You would know Jesus, who he is, his love for you his compassion for you, his kindness towards you, and that you could become more like him. Why? So other people could know Jesus. And everything, my prayer for you is that you could trust God because he has the whole world and your world in his hands, that you would trust God because he is goodness himself come in the flesh. He is for you, not against you. He will walk with you through the valleys that you, uh, of death, through the valleys of sickness, through the valleys of anxiety, through the valleys of questions. He will be with you. And I, want, I pray that you would trust God because he doesn't cause everything in your life, but he will use it. He will use it. So Jesus, thank you for your word. It would get, I pray it would give us life and peace, and hope, and that Jesus, somehow through the work of your spirit, it would build our faith in you and our trust in you. Jesus, we reaffirm, and I want you to do this just privately in your own, just right where you're at, and just in your own words. Would you reaffirm, those of you that are Christian, your commitment to him, to believe in him, to trust in him, to follow him, just in your own words right now, just quietly, right where you're at, just Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you came. I believe you forgive me. I believe that you, you're always with me. Jesus, I trust you. I put my life into your hands. 
And I want to encourage those of you who have never asked Jesus to live in your life. You've never, uh, you've never declared a trust relationship with him, a faith relationship with him, and you want to do that right now. All you have to do is simply pray that Jesus come into my life. Just, you don't have to pray that, those words. Pray any words that come to your mind, but invite him into your life. Say, Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I trust you. I may not have all the answers. I may not understand all of this, but God, today, I'm choosing to believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me and to live in me through the Holy Spirit. With eyes closed, if that's you, you prayed that prayer for the first time, a prayer like that, in the quietness of right where you're at, would you do me the honor of being the first person you tell you? I won't be the last, but let me be the first person you tell today, but simply by just lifting your hand up and looking up at me, and I'm gonna agree with you. I'm not gonna do anything else. I'm not gonna embarrass you in any way. I just wanna celebrate with you. If you made that commitment, just raise your hand and look up at me. Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, great decision. Great decision. Anyone else? Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for life, new life, fresh life, Jesus, I know we haven't answered anything really. But Lord, what I know and what I choose to believe is that you have life. And that's all I want is to be found in you. Not found in myself, but found in you. Not having my own righteousness, but something that comes from you that, that, that empowers my life to be lived with more compassion and more goodness, both in this life and in the next. I thank you, Jesus, for your word. Amen. Amen.